How do you build a fire when it's 100 degrees Fahrenheit and all you have is ice? Sounds impossible, right? But for the Inuit, survival in the planet's harshest environments depends on mastering the impossible. For thousands of years, they've lived in the Arctic, where temperatures drop so low, your breath freezes in midair, and firewood. That's a luxury they've never had. So how do they do it? It starts with knowing how to work with what nature gives, even if it's just snow, ice, and a few animal remains. First, let's get one thing straight. You can't literally set ice on fire. Ice is just frozen water, and water kills fire. But the Inuit figured out how to turn ice from something that freezes you into something that saves you. They learned to use the environment and their own bodies to make things burn. Let's break it down. Let me know to continue when you're ready. They begin by creating shelter. That's step one. Without a wind barrier, nothing stays lit. So they carve out an igloo or dig a snow trench to block the Arctic winds. Inside, Temperatures can rise dramatically, not warm exactly but survivable, and most importantly calm enough to light a fire. Next comes fuel. But where do you find fuel in a frozen desert? For the Inuit, the answer has always been seal fat, also called blubber. Seal blubber is nature's miracle fuel. It burns hot, lasts long, and it's something the Inuit have access to after a hunt. They slice it into strips and use it just like we'd use firewood or oil slowly feeding it into a flame. But what about the flame itself? That's where things get really clever. To start a fire, they traditionally used a tool called a kulik, an ancient oil lamp made from soapstone. It's shaped like a shallow bowl and filled with seal fat. Along the rim, they lay arctic cotton grass or moss, dried and used as a wick. No matches, no lighters. They'd use sparks from flint quartz, or even metal scraped against stone, to ignite the wick. It takes skill, patience, and hands that can work in the cold without freezing. Once it lights, the kulik becomes more than just a lamp. It's a heater, a stove, a lifeline. It warms the igloo, dries wet clothes, cooks food, and melts ice into drinkable water. A single flame, burning from fat and moss, sustaining life in a place colder than most of us. The qualic isn't just a tool, it's a symbol of survival. Passed down through generations, mothers taught daughters how to trim the wick just right. Fathers showed sons how to harvest blubber and keep the flame steady even when the world outside howled with snow and wind. And here's something wild. The qualic doesn't just fight the cold. It creates a sense of home. In the blue, white world of ice and silence, that soft yellow glow becomes a center of life warmth, and even comfort. Now think about this. No trees, no firewood, no modern gear, just ice fat and knowledge. That's all the Inuit needed. They didn't conquer the cold with more heat. They worked with the cold. They adapted, they improvised, and they survived. Generation after generation, in temperatures that would kill most of us in minutes. And even today, that knowledge still lives on. While modern Inuit might use gas stoves or insulated homes, many elders still remember the old ways. Some still light the kulik in ceremonies to honor their ancestors, their culture, and the power of human resilience. So next time you light a match, flip on a stove, or complain about the cold, you remember this somewhere out there, in the silent, frozen corners of the earth, people once built a fire using nothing but ice, fat, and wisdom. The ingenuity of the Inuit doesn't stop at fire. Their entire way of life is a masterclass in adaptation. In a place where metal freezes to skin and the sun disappears for months, they develop tools, techniques, and traditions that turned impossibility into routine. Take their clothing, for example. Made from caribou and seal skins stitched with bone needles and sinew threads, every layer was designed to trap heat, wick away moisture, and allow freedom of movement in the snow. No synthetic fabric comes close to what they engineered centuries ago, or their diet. High in fat and protein, low in carbohydrates, perfectly suited for energy in sub-zero temperatures. While the Western world only recently caught onto the ketogenic diet, the Inuit were living it by necessity, thriving off what the land and sea could offer. Even their homes, the igloo, often misunderstood as just a dome of snow, 
were built with precision. The blocks cut at a specific angle. The entrance dug below the living space to trap cold air. The interior sometimes lined with animal hides for extra insulation. A structure made of frozen water, warmer inside than the world outside by dozens of degrees. And the key to it all, Deep observation, over time they studied wind patterns, animal behavior, snow conditions. They passed down knowledge orally, not through books, but through stories, songs, and lived experience. Every generation became more skilled, more in tune with the Arctic's rhythm. They didn't fight nature, they listened to it, and in doing so, they became part of it. Inuit survival was never a solo effort. Families lived, hunted, and traveled together. Tasks were divided not by status, but by necessity. Everyone had a role, from the elders who carried generations of knowledge to the youngest children learning how to read the snow, the ice, the wind. When food was scarce, it was shared. When a seal was caught, it wasn't just for the hunter. It was for the group. The blubber went into the quillic. The meat was divided. The skin used for clothing or tools. Nothing wasted. Everything honored, this deep connection, to each other, to the environment, to the animals, is what truly set their survival apart. The Arctic was not their enemy. It was their teacher, harsh, unforgiving, but full of lessons for those willing to pay attention. And this mindset extended to how they navigated vast, featureless landscapes. With no maps, no GPS, and no roads, Inuit hunters memorized coastlines, snowdrifts, the shape of stars, the feel of the wind. They could travel miles in whiteout conditions using intuition, tradition, and silent knowledge passed down like sacred code. Even the dogs, the powerful sled teams, weren't just transportation. They were part of the family, trained, trusted, relied upon in life and death situations. Each dog knew its place, each responded to voice alone, and together they could outrun a blizzard or carry supplies across frozen seas. This wasn't luck, this was mastery of place, of people, of life itself. For the Inuit, life was always in motion. They followed the seasons, not just by calendar, but by subtle signs, the return of birds, the behavior of sea ice, the change in animal migration. These weren't guesses. They were patterns memorized over centuries. Migrations weren't optional. They were survival. Following the caribou inland during warmer months, heading back to the coast, when the seals returned to the ice. Every move timed with precision. Their hunting techniques were just as refined. In winter, seal hunting often involved standing motionless over a single breathing hole for hours, sometimes longer. The hunter waited in silence, listening for the faintest sound beneath the ice. The soft exhale of a seal surfacing. A quick strike with a harpoon tipped in bone or metal, and the family would eat. In summer, they used kayaks, sleek, silent vessels made from driftwood frames and covered in seal skin, perfectly designed to glide over water without scaring prey. Harpoons thrown by hand, guided by skill and patience. Even whales, the giants of the sea, were part of their world. With teamwork, knowledge of currents, and deep respect for the animals, entire communities participated in wild hunts. A single bowhead whale could feed dozens for months, and every part blubber, bone, meat, baleen, was put to use. And always there was fire, or rather, the idea of fire. Even when the quillic wasn't burning, the warmth of community, tradition, and ancestral knowledge carried them through. Because for the Inuit, fire wasn't just a flame. It was life. It was wisdom. It was warmth in a frozen world, passed not only from wick to wick, but from one generation's hands to the next. They didn't just survive the cold. The story of how the Inuit build fire in the coldest places on Earth is more than just a tale of survival. It's a testament to human ingenuity, resilience, and respect for nature. In a land where others would see nothing but ice and death, the Inuit found warmth, life, and wisdom. They built fire not just with flame, but with knowledge passed through hands, stories, and time. And in that frozen silence, they proved something powerful. Even in the harshest places on earth, humanity finds a way. 